Good morning. Thank you very much for your attendance here. We are very proud to have this uh, 11th, 11th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast. My name is Jack Spraga, and it's my honor and privilege to serve as president of this great institution, uh, Bristol Community College. 12,200 students, the largest undergraduate in institution of higher education, public institution of higher education, or any institution of higher education in Southeastern Mass. Thank you. Well, uh, we are, uh, have, the, have this opportunity to celebrate the life and the spirit and the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and I hope that uh, it will be many more than 11 years as we continue to uh, commemorate that uh, watershed moment in August of 1963 uh, when Dr. King made uh, that, that uh, spectacular uh, speech about his dream. Each year we use the time to focus on that uh, speech and on the uh, uh, quotation uh, from, his, from that famous speech, uh, I have a dream that one day my four little children will live in a country where they are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And um, as you know, we still have a ways to go to uh, realize that dream, but uh, the important thing is that we, we keep it in our attention and we begin, uh, we continue to our efforts to uh, move forward to realize that great moment that Dr. King spoke about. What Dr. King um, <clears throat> held dear is something that we hold dear here at Bristol Community College. And as you know, uh, education is the key uh, to what troubles the world, okay? It's the answer to everything. Not money, but education. And uh, so we're doing our part here at, uh, in southeastern uh, Massachusetts with Bristol Community College where, um, as you know about, uh, speaking about money and economic development, the two greatest indicators that we need to work on, levels of literacy and levels of educational attainment here in southeastern Massachusetts. Both are lower than we would uh, ever want them to be, um, and um, I'm embarrassed by them as an educator. It's my job to fix those levels. Um, so uh, we, that is our part in per pursuing Dr. King's dream, and I know that you uh, feel the same way by your presence here today. Uh, Dr. King set a gold standard that takes on um, even more significance to, uh, to remember in this year as we reflect on um, horrendous events in Tucson. Um, uh, we had uh, six people killed and 13 people injured in that uh, horrific uh, episode. It is about a year, a also it is about a year after the uh, horrendous uh, uh, episode in Haiti um, and uh, also uh, we had, uh, speaking of a dream where people are treated uh, with civility and respect, this is in October, we had the uh, death of Tyler Clementi, the Rutgers student who uh, took his own life as a result of uh, being bullied about his, uh, his uh, circumstances. Uh, so you can see almost every day you read in the paper that there are episodes and uh, we need to continue to move forward and to er eradicate the circumstances that permit those episodes to occur. We know that Dr. King's message of kindness and equality can help us heal uh, from these uh, episodes and these types of situations. Our breakfast also serves as Bristol uh, Community College's kickoff for the college's uh, African American History Month, which will occur on uh, February 1st. We hope you will take advantage of the events that uh, have been scheduled thus far, more are coming, and there should be a list on, on, your, uh, on the website, and the flyer on the table will uh, uh, explain how you could get access to that. Now, something I always say about uh, African American History Month or Women's History or uh, any of these special act uh, periodic activities is that they are not periodic. We don't wait till February 1st and end on February 28th to celebrate our African American history uh, heritage. Um, and uh, so this is an ongoing effort, 365 days a year, 24-7, so as we celebrate, not only tolerate, but celebrate and embrace diversity.
university. And it uh, makes us uh, as strong as we are here at Bristol Community College and uh, in southeastern Massachusetts. Please note in particular that there is a free course uh, being uh, offered starting on Tuesday for uh, five evening, five weeks rather, five, five weeks, uh, Tuesday evenings. It starts March 1st and it's based on the readings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, this is a great opportunity to read his work and discuss it and, uh, and also and get some college credit for it. And uh, uh, the professor is Dr. Ronald Weisberger. I saw him here somewhere, Ron, if you could raise your hand and people will thank you very much for volunteering that course. Dr. Ronald Weisberger. This breakfast begins together, uh, brings together the community to stage this grand celebration. Uh, and uh, now to begin uh, the event, I would like to welcome uh, Reverend Darrell Malden, pastor of the Bethel AME Church of Fall River. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. To the president, um, to the faculty, to the mayor, um, to all dignitaries and friends and just uh, children of God, I, I greet you all this morning. Uh, to all the clergy present, I greet you. So good to see all of your faces in a, in a mixed, in a variety of faces in uh, different shades and different colors. And I think Martin Luther King would be very pleased to see us all together here united, uh, breaking bread together, but also in celebration of this day. Uh, there's tall, there's short, there's all mixture of people. There's uh, long haired and short haired and follically challenged as myself. So, <laughs> amen, so it's just, it's just good to see all of you. And um, let's just bow our heads in humble submission for prayer. God of the universe, God of creation, God of grace and God of mercy, we call upon your name right now. We ask that your spirit, your loving spirit be in this place as we celebrate and commemorate um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. We ask that your peace be with us during this event. God, uh, truly we struggle in this day and age with so many things, uh, so much violence and injustice and unfairness and inequality, God, that we need your spirit to correct these things. So no, not, not only let your spirit be in this place, uh, be around the state and be around this country and be in this world that we, your people, will come together under your name and under your banner. So bless this day, and it will be blessed. And we pr pray in your matchless name, God, and bless the food that we have uh, eaten and are eating right now, God, and, and bless the hands that have prepared it. And just have your spirit dwell with us in this place. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Malden. We'll be uh, mentioning it later this morning as well, but uh, at the Bethel AME Church on Hanover Street, there will be a service at 11.15, and uh, everyone is invited. All right. Thank you, Reverend. Um, it is also, uh, that event is also sponsored by the uh, uh, Interfaith Council of Fall River. Well, uh, as we start, I would like to uh, pay uh, tribute to the general support of our sponsors. Uh, it could not happen an event like this. As I said this morning on the radio, you don't hear the word breakfast and free in the same sentence anymore nowadays. Uh, uh, but it's because of the great uh, support that we have received from Citizens for Citizens and uh, Mark Sullivan and uh, the organization have been behind us uh, from the very start. And we're very grateful. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. In addition, other sponsors and uh, supporters, the City of Fall River, and uh, we'll be meeting Mayor Flanagan a little bit later in the school system, uh, the BCC Alumni Association, the BCC uh, Affirmative Action Committee, 
and um, <clears throat> the BCC Multicultural Affairs Committee. And we also have a bit of uh, support from our Teaching American History grant as well. And uh, an event as complex and uh, uh, demanding and challenging as this uh, is not easily uh, staged. And uh, we just couldn't happen, it couldn't happen without our, uh, our wonderful supporters and also the organizing committee that works all year to develop uh, this event. Um, we have uh, uh, Tafa Awalaju and Sally Cameron are the co-chairs of our committee. <laughs> And other members of the committee, uh, just quickly mention Jane Ash, Milton Clement, Carol Martin, Cindy Poor Parasol, Bob Rezendis, and Linda Viveros, and many other people at the college have helped as well. I would also like to pay special tribute to the efforts of educators in, this, in the school system who have uh, helped us with the poster contest. Uh, this year. Thanks to them, we are able to enjoy the beautiful work. I hope you had a chance to uh, view them in the lobby. If you haven't, or if you'd like to, again, they'll still be there as we, uh, as we leave uh, out there in the, uh, in the lobby of the building. Uh, <clears throat> we're able to enjoy the beautiful work of the local middle school students in the, uh, Sandra Arnold of Cuss Middle School. I'd like to pay a, uh, special attention to her. And uh, Jennifer uh, Matai of Morton Middle School as well. I think Henry Lord also provided some uh, uh, contestants, if you will, or participants, and uh, just wouldn't happen without them, and we're very grateful to you. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> this year we had a record number of poster uh, uh, participants, uh, over 260 uh, uh, people participated, and posters were submitted, and we're very happy about that. And I want to also uh, uh, thank um, uh, Stephanie Baker from CUS and Rochelle Patinodi from CUS uh, for their help as well. It's not easily done, and uh, 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 Meg Bale Brown, the superintendent, and uh, everyone associated with the schools, and the, uh, uh, of course, the mayor, uh, to make sure that this uh, that this occurred and that we can bring breathe life and bring uh, new life, if you will, to Dr. King's dream. And I think as you look at those posters, you will see what, what we mean by that. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the wonderful work that you've enjoyed of our musicians here today, uh, who provided such a wonderful atmosphere for us. Uh, Louis Lima and Michael Crowley, thank you very much. This breakfast has become a community tradition in Greater Fall River, I'm pleased to say, and I would like to acknowledge some of the community leaders who have joined us uh, uh, this morning and uh, provide their support. Some couldn't be with us and sent their, uh, uh, their letters of support and words of support. Uh, we have uh, Mayor Will Flanagan. Uh, if you could just rise uh, for now, you'll be seeing, hearing more from him. <clears throat> District Attorney Sam Sutter. We have trustees, uh, BCC uh, uh, on the board of trustees, Zelma Braga, Zelma. <laughs> Joe Marshall, Joe Marshall. <laughs> Cynthia Rose, Cynthia Rose. And Donald Smith, Donald Smith. Now also we have some uh, office holders here who I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge um, Representative Kevin Aguiar, Representative Aguiar, <laughs> Representative Shauna O'Connell from Taunton, Shauna, Re Representative Paul Schmidt, Representative Paul Schmidt, <laughs> Representative David Sullivan, BCC alum. I should also mention that Sean O'Connell is, uh, is a community college graduate. Um, also, uh, <laughs> uh, Senator Mike Rodericks. Senator Mara Rodericks. <laughs> we have uh, Ken Fiola from the City of Fall River Office of Economic Development. We have Jill Yusek from the school committee at New Bedford. Jill. We have Governor's Council, Charles Suffolk. Charles. 
said his brother is coming also. <laughs> and we have a candidate for Fall River City Council, Michael Ramos. Michael. Well, thank you very much. I always like to, when people say, uh, have, have I missed anyone important? Can uh, raise, raise your hand. <laughs> Now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce the New Bethel, New Bedford Bethel AME Church Choir. The New Bedford Bethel AME Church Choir are going to help us. Thank you. singing for our breakfast <laughs> so we're all nervous so <laughs> Lord, we give 
and uh, very glad to have them with us. Also, as always happens, I overlook someone and uh, unintentionally I want to acknowledge uh, the presence of Janet LaBelle from Senator John Kerry's office. <laughs> Senator, I'm sorry, Janet. We're ready to roll. Now to recognize the uh, winners uh, of the poster contest, please join me in welcoming another one of our community partners, the city of Fall River, and of course, uh, Mayor Will Flanagan. Mayor Flanagan. <laughs> bring greetings from the city and announce the winners of the poster contest. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here with all of you this morning. And every January, I look forward to coming here to Bristol Community College uh, to partake in the MLK Community Breakfast. And I do so for a number of reasons. But most importantly, it serves as a reminder of the work of Martin Luther King through his peaceful activism, he was able to show a nation that anything is possible. And no matter what the color of your skin was, no matter what your religion, no matter what your gender, uh, that any person could live up to their God-given talents. And to be here today with all of you and to see the children of our middle schools here today serves as a reminder of King's work and that it was not done in vain and that it still is just as prevalent today as it was 40 to 50 years ago. And, you know, as the mayor of a city of over 90,000 people, I'm constantly asked the question, you know, you want to make improvements in economic development, you want to make improvements in public safety, you want to make improvements in the quality of life of people. And how do you plan to do all that? And I always answer that question with one word, it's education. And to stand here today, uh, this morning, in Bristol Community College, and President Sprague touched a little bit upon this, is through education that we're going to make a change in job creation. It's through education that we're going to make a change in public safety. And it's through education that we're going to improve the quality of life of our citizens. And I see Dr. Evan Fracken here this morning, and he's fought so hard through his dollars for scholars and making sure that our uh, children have an opportunity to obtain a higher education. And it's such a great pleasure for me to be here today to recognize our students uh, for their artwork and for their, for their contribution to today's community breakfast. And if it's okay with President Sprague, I'd like to make some announcements here. And the first honorable mention, uh, these students will receive a $10 gift card uh, for their uh, artwork here today at the community breakfast. And the first person I want to introduce is from the Henry Law Middle School, and that's Tyler Pond. Tyler, are you with us here this morning?
And for those students who weren't able to join us for whatever reason, we'll make sure that the gift cards and awards do get to go to their school so that they can receive them. Our next student uh, from the Henry Law Middle School is Kristen Maddows. Kristen? Another $10 gift card winner from the Henry Law Middle School is Tiana Martinez. Is Tiana here this morning? From the Morton Middle School, a $10 gift card winner is Autumn. Is Autumn here with us? You can tell the students of the Florida Public Schools took advantage of today's holiday and decided to get a little extra sleep this morning, which is okay. One more honorable mention is from the Morton Middle School, and that's Leolana Harmontree. Is Leolana here this morning? Third place winners will receive a $20 gift card, and from the Cuss Middle School is Grace Perry. Grace? Another winner from the Cuss Middle School is Alexia Cody. Alexia? Our third $25 gift card winner is Frankie Yam from the Henry Law Middle School. Is Frankie here this morning? <laughs> Our second place winners will receive a $50 gift card, and we have two second place winners. The first from the Cuss Middle School is Katrina Ferreira. Katrina? And our second $50 gift card winner is from the Cuss Middle School and is Angela Reed. Angela? Now each student that has come to the microphone, President Sprague has been asking them if they want to say a few words, and each, each student has declined to do so. And our first prize winner is going to receive a $75 gift card, and uh, the student is from the Morton Middle School, and that's Samuel Lima. Samuel?
once again, I want to congratulate all the students for uh, participating in today's contest and thank all the teachers who are here this morning uh, helping our students succeed in the public school system. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I hope everyone noticed that uh, Mayor Flanagan is wearing his BCC pin very proudly. <laughs> They're very expensive. They're hard to come by. <laughs> the Distinguished African American Alumni Award for BCC is presented uh, annually uh, by our BCC Alumni Association to recognize outstanding achievement. And here to introduce this year's award winner is Peter Silva from the class of 1973. Uh, uh, and for, for, he's going to make the announcement on behalf of the uh, BCC Alumni Association. Peter? Once again, good morning. Thank you. So welcome to uh, Mr. Community College as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Do Dr. Martin Luther King holiday. <clears throat> so a year ago uh, this week, uh, we were stunned by the events in Haiti uh, the Haitian government this week reported that the uh, death toll uh, is now over 300,000. <clears throat> many of those deaths resulted from uh, buildings constructed with poor materials. Uh, there were no local building codes, uh, no engineering standards. I want to tell you a story that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King would have surely been proud of and supported. Um, this is not a college somewhere. This is an active community college. This school, in the aftermath of the earthquake, raised at least $10,000. And with that money, uh, seven of our BCC Haitian students were able to go home in the springtime. Three additional students from this college who were unable to go home. Uh, monies were uh, forwarded directly to their families to assist, to assist them with the financial aid that was needed. Now, in Haiti at that time, there were uh, among, there were students or people who were aspiring college people whose, of course, their lives were shattered uh, by the events in Haiti. And I want you to know that, uh, that the school uh, made provisions and six of those, six of those students from Haiti uh, are now here attending BCC uh, in our civil engineering program. Okay, upon the completion of, of the program here, they will return back to their country and they of course will help, be able to help with the reconstruction of the buildings there, okay? One of our Haitian students uh, is here with us today. Her name is Rose Bazil, and I would like her to graciously rise and be recognized. Rose. So now we fast forward to uh, today. I'm here to recognize the Reverend Ted C. Davis. He was born in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. He attended the local schools there and uh, attended one year at Grambling College uh, before he joined the Navy. He joined the Navy and eventually found his way to Newport, Rhode Island. He served in the Navy for seven years. Uh, and thereupon, he, he retired as a disabled veteran. He is a, uh, a member of the American Legion and 
49 years ago, he married Barbara Watson, who is now Barbara Watson Davis, and I would like to recognize Ms. Watson, uh, Ms. Davis. Mrs. Davis. So uh, Reverend Davis graduated from Bristol Community College in 1972 uh, with a degree from the pre-professional program. He then went on to Barrington College where he received his bachelor's degree in biblical studies. He then attended the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and the University Without Walls, the uh, Shaw Divinity School in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay, he is an itinerant elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church and he has pastored at the, uh, the Bethel AME in Plymouth, uh, the Mount Zion AME Church in Newport, and the Bethel AME Church in Fall River. He's past president of the Fall River NAACP and the Fall River Brotherhood Center. Uh, he's been very active in many places and many key positions. He's been, um, he's presently with the Fraternal Order of Masons. This is an organization that awards many grants and scholarships and counsels many students. So I am honored to present the, uh, the Bristol Community College Distinguished African American Award to Reverend Davis. In part, it reads, uh, for professional accomplishment, contribution to your community, and a commitment to students pursuing a college education. Uh, I want to present this award to Reverend Davis. Tees for the ten dollars recipient, I have your time. <laughs> <laughs> to the Honorable Mayor Flanagan, President Vega, my colleague, the Reverend Dal Malton and Reverend Dal Mia, and other clergy here present, distinguished persons, to Mrs. Barbara Davis. I greet you this morning with Jesus' joy. It is an honor for me to be recognized as the recipient of this Bristol Community College Alumni Association Award. 39 years ago, I passed the mills of Durfee Street to enter Bristol Community College. God has smiled on me and he has set me free. God has smiled on me. He has been good to me. I have a theme for life, and it's the second verse from the song of a charge to keep I have. And that theme is to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. May I in all my powers engage to do the master's will. Today I want to express my gratitude to the Bristol Community College Alumni Association and to Bristol Community College faculty and selecting me as your recipient of this award. I am deeply humbled for this special honor. My family 
And many of them, it's under the weather today. One started out and couldn't have to turn back. The flu, the viruses are just attacking and look like they picked this week to attack the Davis family. <laughs> but however, my family joins me with words of joy and thanksgiving as the recipient of this very prestigious award. We commend you in your endeavor to keep education as a top, top priority here in the greater Fall River community. President Braga, keep the good work and educators. Don't wait until the community college receive them, prepare them at the elementary level so that we can have better educators when they come to this level. So I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. <laughs>Surely blessed we have all the clergy people here and Mark Sullivan as well with all the clergy. <laughs> and also another distinguished visitor who was recognized, I want to just mention to you quickly, Dr. Irving Fratkin. Dr. Fratkin. <clears throat> the Citizen Scholarship Foundation, uh, we, uh, we know and loved it as the term dollars for scholars. Uh, I remember when I first got here, uh, that uh, Dr. Fratkin said, I hope we can someday get to the point where we have raised one billion dollars across the country. And uh, I want you to know that uh, some few years later, he quickly passed that mark, the, not he, but the group uh, quickly passed that mark, and now they're over two, two billion, and they're looking at 2.5 billion with a B, dollars for scholarships. Thank you, Dr. Fratkin. Just celebrating 50 years 50 years of uh, service. He likes to tell the story that he started with one, one dollar from um, Eleanor Roosevelt. He placed a collect call to President Eisenhower, uh, who I don't think took the call. I'm not sure. But thank you, Dr. Fratkin. And go back to my earlier comment about the importance of education. You've heard it over and over today. Uh, and uh, uh, the great work of the Citizen Scholarship Foundation uh, is, makes great contributions. People would not would not be able to participate in higher education were it not for the scholarships that are made available and also for the unique American uh, public higher education system of community colleges. Other people just would not be able to come here. We have 12,200 students at Bristol. Half the students in the country in undergraduates are in community colleges. So just imagine if it were not for those community colleges, where would they go? In, a, in an increasingly complex society that requires uh, some higher education. So uh, we're very proud of the work that we play, and thank you, Dr. Fradkin, for what you do. Well, it's my privilege now to introduce our main uh, speaker, our keynote speaker, if you will, Dr. Clara Anton, who is someone uh, who would not take no for an answer, a native of Haiti. He says that his whole life he heard the word no, and no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. No, you can't graduate from high school. No, you can't go to college. No, you cannot be a doctor. But even though he speaks eight, eight different languages, I hope he'll speak in English today for us. So. <laughs> no was not in his vocabulary. He has become a well, uh, world-renowned obstetrician uh, specializing in high-risk pregnancies. Uh, another population that hears the word no perhaps a lot. And there are many parents who are glad he doesn't know the meaning of no. So it's my honor and our privilege to uh, introduce to you and present 
Dr. Clarel Antoine, our keynote speaker. Now, the first thing I have to say is I was just briefly reminded that I may be in the wrong place. I sat next to Mr. Fiola, Ken Fiola from the mayor's office. His first question to me was, uh, how often do you speak? I said, I speak very often, but my lectures usually are scientific lectures on obstetrics and gynecology. <laughs> and this is the first time I am giving a lecture of that sort. Now, the preceding speakers cast some doubt how well I'm going to be doing. They are so, so, so great. I thank you, Dr. Zwega, for your very kind introduction and for allowing me to join you your staff and invited guests to celebrate this special day today at Bristol Community College. As we celebrate the birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martha Luther King Jr., I'm particularly honored to be with all of you today to share the story of my dream. Dr. Sprager, I hold a deep respect for the work you and your staff do here and for the opportunities that you afford everyone in this community. And I love the affirmation of the college as expressed on your website. This is the place where students come first and go far. We just a minute ago, congratulations, uh, Reverend uh, Ted Davis. He was a student here and has gone very far. And myself, I know that to be true. I live with my wife, Deborah, who was born here in Fall River, studied here as BCC, in the early 70s, maybe I should say 90s, but I can't lie, early 70s, <laughs> and then went on to complete her B.A. degree in education. She then accepted a teaching job in Swansea, Massachusetts, later on to become a doctor of education at Columbia University. Now you could ask yourself, how far is far? Well, she then became the vice president of communication for a leading uh, TV uh, broadcasting channel in New York City, Channel 13, and now is the president and CEO of the New York Junior Tennis League. And she continues to dream on, God knows. Now, uh, Deborah and her family joined me in thanking our friend, the Vice President for Human Resources and Affirmative Action, Mr. Tafa Aulaju, for his invitation to me to tell my story. As we celebrate the civil rights activists with a dream, my story also relates to someone with a dream. The start of my story, as you heard, is you just can't do it. You've heard that I was born in Haiti. It was in 1947. Unfortunately, as you know, the story of Haiti, this unfortunate country, who I've just heard exactly a year ago, suffered a catastrophic earthquake which killed over 300,000 people and left more than one and a half million people still living in tents. But they too have dreams, despite the additional recent epidemic of cholera. As wholeheartedly, I thank the administrative leadership and student body of this college for all they've done on behalf of Haiti, including most recently accepting six Haitian students in the uh, engineering department. I was a happy child myself growing up in Haiti. My mother was an elementary school teacher and my father was in construction, a construction worker. We live in a small house with an outdoor shower. Uh, we call outdoor latrines. They are what you use in summer camp and kind of an outhouse. The house was made of cinder blocks with a metal tin roof and tile roofing. The cooking was done, was done outside in a coal fire. You take four rocks and you put a couple of twigs around and some coal and you will cook outside. It was a good life growing up with my two brothers and my sister. The three boys shared, uh, I would say, a very small bedroom by American standard, and my sister shared the other one. We had some help with a local, it's called a wrist havoc. Wrist havoc for a uh, meaning French, stay with. Usually a teenage girl from the mountains who helped with the household in exchange for food and shelter. My father died when I was uh, just 11 years of age. It was a tremendous loss to the family, leaving my mother to care for me and my siblings. 
with limited resources, we all learned some early lessons about sharing, love, respect, uh, teamwork, and, and caring. And when my blind uh, grandmother came to live with us, uh, and in Haiti, whatever your handicap is, the, the children always fight to have their grandparents at home. So my blind grandmother lived with us. That attracted a steady flow of regular visits from aunts, uncles, and cousins. So I became even more responsible. Grandma died when I was 13 years of age. She died in a hospital with an 18 bed open wards with very little medical care. The setting in an open bed ward, you know, windows are open, birds are flying in and out. It's really nothing like uh, what you see here in America. You're going to have to see it to believe it. But for weeks, she had an intravenous bag of fluid. And the Haitian, they call it serum. And for Haitian, anytime someone has an IV bag, they think they are being treated. That's, that's all you need. You have an IV bag, so you're being cared for. So I was very saddened by her illness, but took part in her caring, applying cold compresses and fanning her in this hot tropical climate. But I remember her looking so wasted and so frail. Uh, she was watched by the female members of the family with such a strong concern for dignity, covering her. It was rather touching to, to, to see all that. My mother was a firm believer in education, very adamant about self-respect and respect to others, and passionate about physical presentation, as she stressed regularly. Thus, in my hospital, people always ask me, do I sleep with a bow tie? Because I always wear a bow tie. <laughs> no. <clears throat> But my high school education was spent in seminary school taught by a Jesuit priest. When I was not in school, I spent my time as a Boy Scout serving poor people in the impoverished uh, areas of Port-au-Prince and nearby cities. I was also very involved in my church, attending daily services. I was an altar boy with specific duties to perform during the Holy Mass. I was also in the choir performing in mass and charitable events. And I thought I was good in the choir until I heard the Bethel group. Yeah, I thought I was good, but my hat's to you. So as a young boy, I learned about myself and I had a real passion for reading and studying. I would spend a great deal of time under a street lamp post reading and doing my homework as electricity at, in Haiti is very scarce. I was largely isolated from the sophistication of the West, Western world, so I had no complaint. I had no complaints at all, no clue that my conditions of living were mediocre. I was a happy boy. Uh, that is until the political and economic situations of Haiti changed our simple family life. Like all immigrants around the world, my mother and her four teenage children then looked to America for a better uh, future. In 1966, after I completed the, it's called the baccalaureate program in Haiti, which is the equivalent of two years beyond the American high school system here, my brother and I came to New York to join my mother and the other siblings who arrived two years later, earlier. I applied to City College of New York and I was accepted. I also had applied to Columbia University of New York and we drew I withdrew my application when I learned that the credit, the cost per credit was $150 per credit, and I needed 15 credits. So the choice was very clear, going to City College for $15 of credit, $240, it was a clear choice. But I did not have $240, so I got a job. It's very interesting. That job it was at night, going to supermarkets and AMPs, doing inventories. At the time, they would close the, uh, the, the stores at 12, from 12 to 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. There was no computer. You have a board, you have a paper, and you mark the items, whatever is remaining on the shelves. As the luck goes, my job was to count ice cream in a freezer box. <laughs> You know, 
no, sharp contrast to the climate that I'm accustomed to. So I come in and punch, and I would just go to the uh, freezer box and start counting ice cream. Anyway, filled with enthusiasm and abundance of dream, I embarked on my educational journey in America, and City College was the first place I heard the expression, you just can't do it. Uh, I was discouraged to major in physical chemistry by everyone on the college staff, as well as my fellow black students who all favored then black history. Now, mind you, we're talking about 1967, four years after the famous I Have a Dream speech for racial equality by the Reverend Dr. King. I was discouraged to apply to medical school, but I trusted in the published requirements for entrance into medical school. The then catalogs, we don't have computers, nothing, there was no computers. You have to have a catalog of booklets. The catalogs clearly specify the requirements preferably of a major in science, a 3.4 cumulative average, no D in any science. And every time I would meet someone says, well, you don't bother, just don't apply, they won't take you. They haven't taken someone like you in medical school. But I said, but the booklet says, I said, forget about booklets, brother. The booklet says, well, I finally, this theme the current theme of You Just Can't Do It followed me to my educational process. As honestly, the fellow students and the staff member, they really honestly, from the heart, tried to protect, uh, protect me from the humiliation of rejection. That's, that's, that's the way I viewed it. But I realized that I had a greater strength, which is my faith in God, my trust in myself, the support of all my family members, good friends, as well as good grades. So I forged ahead with all my goals in mind. It was with immense satisfaction that I made the dean's list at City College and, uh, and subsequently was appointed as a tutor in French, in math, in chemistry to help fellow students who had trouble in the uh, difficulties in this area. So despite the lack of support from my colleagues and college counselors, I was accepted to Columbia University of New York City at the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Now, attending medical school at Columbia just crystallized my vision as a doctor. My years of clerkship, clinical clerkships is after you learn the basic science, you start being exposed to patients. These years exposed me to the brightest physicians, to the most outstanding teachers in education. They, they had exemplary bedside manners. These years exposed me to a superior education and exceptional personal grooming. The doctors then, question mark, now, the doctors then, they took pride in, in dressing well and looking presentable. Uh, um, so I just wanted to be just like these doctors that I trained with. I was uh, then about 23 years of age. 23 years of age, and I did very well. Now, the process of applying to training program, college residency program, began. Now, I was a good student. I did everything everybody else did. I graduated with good grades at the college. Columbia University, and I'm applying now to Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. No, I went to college. I have to say that again. I went to college. Now I'm in medical school, I'm applying to Columbia. And I'm faced again, you can't do it. You just can't do it. I'm saying, why? He said, you just can't do it. And the thing is, rarely I've been, I was given an answer why. It was always you can't do it. So that was very helpful because I took it as I, as I wanted to take it. But I applied anyway and I was accepted to Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center for my residency. There I did a training for four years in obstetrics and gynecology. For the first time in 1979, the residency program director created an award for excellence to the physician for best bedside manners 
and teaching skills to the other doctors. Your Clara Antoine held the diploma of the Howard C. Taylor Award for Excellence. This has been then the tradition from then on up on today. So, <clears throat> and it was with great pride when I was the president of the Alumni Residency Association of the Doctors uh, three years ago that I presented the Howard C. Taylor Award to the resident doctor and reminded them humbly that I was the first one to have received it. <laughs> so after the four years of graduation as the best doctor, now I'm applying to New York University Medical Center to do a fellowship and research in high-risk pregnancy. You know, it never occurred to me that someone was going to tell me no. I was the best doctor. I mean, I mean, well, <clears throat> where do you want to go? And, and, and someone dared to kind of to cast some doubt by saying, um, you're going to NY, it could be a mistake, said, you're going to NY Jude, I don't know, I'm going to NYU, and said, well, um, I, I don't think you'll make it. You, you, sh you know, don't waste your time. And the usual thing, you call, you find out what the requirements are, preferably from a major hospital, have good recommendations. So I was accepted. Accepted at NYU to do a fellowship of two years. In two years, I did very well. Can I ran around lecturing left and right. I knew my <laughs> I knew my literature. I published about twelve papers in two years. I probably spoke ten times about fetal monitoring, how to protect babies from distress. I'm, I'm good at it. I'm doing okay here, but I'm good at that. So, um, so now, in May of 1981, after the, a month or two months before I completed my fellowship program, I'm looking for a place to have a practice. After your fellowship program, now you need to hang your shingles Dr. Antoine and invite people to come in. Now, I was the fourth, we call it a fellow, fourth fellow into the program. The program started four years before me. All the previous doctors graduated before me as a fellow, they were automatically offered a position to stay on staff. Now, May of 1981, July of 1981, I must start a practice. I must have my cards printed, have patients know where I'm practicing for them to come in. Nobody said a word to me. So I decided I would walk to the chairman uh, of the department, his office. Very nice guy. I know that he had respect for me. We have conferences called clinical morbidity or mortality conferences. Those are conferences where they present cases of what has happened uh, during the previous week. Every Wednesday morning at nine o'clock, the chairman will call upon me and says, Dr. Antoine, what does the literature say? And at the time, I'm right on top of everything. I would say the American College for Bidjoin, volume 23, page 58 to 57, Dr. So-and-so said, the guy was impressed. So I knew he knew what I was talking about. But the time is now for me to have privileges. And I told him, uh, I'm here uh, requesting your support to apply for privileges so I could admit patients to the hospital and see patients. And he looked at me said, hmm, you know, if I were you, I would not do that. Okay, there we go again. You know, uh, and I am doing that now, I'm shaking my head, but when I'm facing with this thing, I just, it's when I'm numb. I just really, it doesn't really, it just 
goes over my head. He said, if only I would not do that. And I asked him, uh, but I've been here for two years, and, and this is what I would like to do. He said, well, you know, this is a very neat community here. I said, yeah, I understand that. I've been here for two years. He said, the, the, the doctors here, they're just like brothers and sisterhood here, and they're not really going to refer patients to you. I said, okay, not going to refer, huh? yeah, okay. And said, however, if you join the practice here, we would expect that you would contribute to the overhead expenses like everybody else. Because then they have about 10 people practicing in a suite. So I would come in, they'll divide the whole thing in 11 people and I have to pay. So quick math told me that I'm not going to have money and I have to pay overhead. <laughs> but it did not faze me. So uh, the guy told me when I could not get up the chair, I said, well, you know, think about it and let me know. I walked to the distance of the window here, and I came back, I told him, I'll take it. You know, what occurred to me in my mind, I'm saying, I'm the one that's going to talk to patients. And I know in the opinion of people in the world, and my parents, my friends, for 10 years I've been going to medical school, people have always asked me, who do you refer people to? I said, somebody will come to me. So I, I mean, I wasn't, so I said, the guy gave me. So I said, fine, so uh, he'll put in the, uh, the application for privileges, and, in, and in, uh, I could start July 1st. Good, I'm excited, excited. The first person I turned to was a fellow I did research to for two years. So they had two fellows per year. I did research with him for two years in the lab. We were like brothers. Just imagine. Every morning, 7.30, you sit around, playing around with little beepers, and uh, you're mixing chemicals. You play around with little, uh, animals. You're doing things, and you're preparing uh, lectures together. You're writing papers together. I'm excited. The next day I went, I said, my name, I said, Peter, I have privileges to the medical center. Let's, I'm going to take you to lunch to celebrate. Took Peter to lunch to celebrate. And I told him, you know, since you're not ready yet to go into practice, and I am ready, would you please refer patients to me? Because he's a doctor, he's not long. He wanted to do an extra year of research. I said, refer patients to me. I mean, we've been kind of brothers. I mean, we, I, 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 in social occasions, he's there. I've gone to his social affairs. And the guy was quiet and silent. And he looked at me and said, you know, I don't mind referring patients to you, but I will have to tell all of them that you're from Haiti. Hmm. I said, and I have to put that in a, uh, and in 1981 thereabout, you may or may not remember some of you, Haiti was listed by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, as one of the risk factors for HIV, for AIDS. So here I am in 81, felt my friend, my brother friend, said, I'm going to have to tell him that. Uh, quickly I said, no, no, please, do me no favor. That's okay. No, I, I, I don't need patience for me, that's all right. So that, 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 that went on and we did not do anything at all about that. So I, uh, went on then to do the necessary board certification process. You have to take exam, both oral and written exam, have to be certified by the American board so you could practice medicine. So I passed both, both boards in obstetrics and gynecology in 1982 and in high-risk pregnancy in 1983, licensed to practice now, and I'm practicing. Now I've been practicing now for three years, 
three years I'm practicing. Um, I have a practice. In spite of everything, I have a nice practice. But I've been doing that for three years, solo, by myself. I need a break. I need someone to cover my patients for occasional weekends. Now, listen carefully. Everyone behind me after my fellowship, they were already in a group of doctors. They're already in a group, four doctors. They were behind me, but they're already grouped together. And I still don't have a group I belong to. And they were the only group I wanted to be with because they do high-risk pregnancy. But I know them. Some of them I trained because I was ahead of them. So now after three years, I got all my certifications. I decided I'm going to ask them to cover me. I need a vacation. I need... Uh, that's just remarkable. Uh, so three men and one lady. So I go to one of the fellow, the first one that I trained with now is in the group. Now I said, Peter, I'd like to join you. But I, you know, I was beaten by Peter once, but he's in the group. I have to ask him. I said, Peter, I'd like to join the group, says Clarell. And he's kind of making up for it. He said, Clarell, I love you dearly, 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 dearly. Uh, it, it, for me, you're in. But the other three people don't want you in the group. Okay. All right, so I forgot about that. The next day, I bump into Marie. Give me a big hug. Said, hi, my twin brother. Because I trained her a couple of uh, years. So, I said, Marie, I'd like to join the group because I need some coverage. says, no problem at all. I have no issue at all. I'd love you to join. But the other three people don't want you in the group. <laughs> all right. So I still didn't get the message. I didn't get the message. So I went to the third person. So I said, no problem. I'll put in a good word for you, but they don't want you. I'm, I'm warning you, they don't want you. Now, the head of the group is the head of the research division where I did research with. So I made an appointment to see him. And I went, I said, uh, Jack, um, help me out. You know, you are responsible for my scientific uh, success, my academic success. Now, sit down and look at me and tell me what do you think some of my um, deficiencies are in clinical practice? I said, what are you talking about? I said, I, I just want to know how could I improve myself to be a, a, bet, a good doctor. I said, what are you talking about? You're the best doctor I've known here. Said, okay, well, well, I said, okay, the point is now I'm looking for coverage. And I've spoken to the other three doctors. They told me, you don't want me in your practice. I said, me? We've never spoken about that. Well, I said, so why don't you have a meeting and let me know if you'd like me in the practice. So he went, I had a meeting with them. And on May 25th, 1983, shortly before Memorial Day, he came in and says, Clarell, you're in the group and you cover the weekend, of Memorial Day weekend. <clears throat> it's, it's all good. Memorial Day weekend, I came to work on a Friday morning at 8 something in the morning. I left Tuesday. Because <laughs> now I'm covering four people, including myself. I had nine deliveries, and the purpose of being there all day for the weekend was because I don't know the other doctor's patient. So I was always there to welcome them. I welcome them, kind of, I call that open my chest, see me, you know, make no comment, this is me. So I would welcome them and say, you know, I'm Dr. Antoine. I, I know I'm not your doctor, but I'm covering this weekend. I will take good care of you. 
and I would admit them. And because I'm there all the time, I, you know, I, I, would, I would be them throughout the whole delivery process. I'll see them the next morning. I'll discharge them the next day. While I'm seeing somebody else, I'll come by and say hi. And the compliments were simply raving the next day to the other doctors. Said, so this guy Antoine was there all the time. He was so attentive, he was so compassionate. And they're asking me, uh, could I be your patient? I said, no, 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 that's not ethical. <laughs> so I, I knew I was up to a good thing. So it wasn't that bad. So, uh, so what is the next thing? So it appears that the whole idea of you just can't do it began to kind of diffused a little bit. And I think I could tell you the last two things which happened was about 15 years ago. Now I have a booming practice. And the four people, or five, four people were covering me said, your practice is too busy, we can't cover you now. <laughs> All right, I wasn't going to a practice, but my practice is so busy. When they take a phone call for me, they have Weekends, they have four deliveries for me. So I had to get out of the practice, hired my own partner, and then we practiced for five, six years together a lot. And then a new chairman came. A new chairman of the department came. The chairman does exactly what I do, high risk pregnancy. The man came in March, um, I think, 95. And we had a meeting, and he said, Carol, I heard you have the biggest practice in, in the department. Yeah. Well, I would like you to join me. The guy just came there. He said he would like me to join him, OK, uh, in the practice and services for obstetrics in high-risk pregnant ladies. And he added, because he's the chairman, and also he does the same thing that I do, Harry's pregnancy, he added that if I join, do not join him, I run the risk of losing my practice and my patients by the time he comes in in six months. So he's telling me by December of 1995, I may not have a practice. Reverend Davis will understand that. I have faith in God, too. I think things are written for a reason. I'm saying all that because it's written, and man cannot touch me. God can, but man can't touch me. So uh, he said, I'm going to lose a practice in 1995. And please think about it and give him an answer. I thought about it for one second. I'd never give him an answer. And in my mind, I'm saying, I've been doing that for 20 years. I have families and families. I've delivered seven of their children. Some people have delivered three, four, five children. And they're all going to take off and go and see somebody else. I did not see it happening, so I did not tell him anything. And this guy, the following year in 1996, he called me and said, you know, I'm going to name you the director of obstetrics at a major teaching hospital in the medical center. So he named me. So he's learning that I can't do it. So, that's, uh, so that was a very good um, uh, accolade or acknowledgement that I could do it. And the last thing I will share with you, and that one I like, another, the beginning of acceptance that I can do it, Riding an uh, elevator with a kind of silvery, white-haired lady, very well-dressed, and two of us. And uh, she looked at me, and uh, I, I am usually respecting my mother's rich, impeccably dressed. Okay, And I've always said to myself, talking about impeccably dressed, if I go to the hospital with a pair of blue jeans on, and someone says, are you here to deliver a pizza? I will, earn the, I will earn that insult. So I don't do that. So I always have my bow ties on and my white coat very crisp. So the lady looked at my pain and said, 
Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Antoine, yes, it, yeah, good morning, said, uh, he, uh, ho, ho, you must be very good to be here. <laughs> so I smiled. I said, I said, but you must be very good to be here. And I, and I tried to get out of it. And honestly, I told her the following. I said, you know, I have been here for about 20 years or so. 95% of the doctors are great here. Yeah, but as you know, everywhere there are some people who are not good. But 95%, but you must be very good to be here. So now my floor opens up, the doors open up, and I get out and say, thank you so much. I am good to be here. So now, uh, so in, in the course of pursuing my dream, I brought into the world about close to 11,000 newborns. Uh, and, and I'm very happy to contribute to their parents' dream and to their own dreams themselves. And to briefly share my current dream with you, my current dream is my wife and I were working very hard in promoting compassion into medicine. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we created a corporation called RX, the treatment sign RX Compassion. It's incorporated in New York. It has a tax exempt status. And uh, my brother in law, Brian, is going to finish the website and make sure it's as polished as it can be. And the purpose of the corporation is to support, promote caring and compassion in all medical facilities. The dream, the vision is that each staff member in any medical center or any healthcare institutions treat and greet all patients with the most compassionate care deserving by patients with dignity and respect. So this is what the goal is. And we're working very hard in raising funds, creating curriculum, and making that a culture. When I said a culture, so everyone, from the God that first greets you at the door, the God has to be attentive to see if you need a wheelchair. I mean, it's really, to the nutritionist on the floor, should not really simply drop your tray on the table without knowing if you have time to eat or not, or if you are hungry. You could simply put the tray there and say, how do you feel today? I mean, it, it's not medical care, but I think it's a spectrum of being hospitable and caring. So <clears throat> in conclusion, my story is the story of a Haitian immigrant with well-defined dreams and inner expectations, which prevailed over the limited thoughts and perceptions of some people around me. I am sure that each of you hold dreams and aspirations of your own for your education, your career, your family life, for your health, your generosities, and other achievements. Uh, Geoffrey Holder, a Trinidadian artist, actor, and choreographer of the Broadway show The Wiz, uses an expression that I have carried with me. Speak your dreams out loud. I think I met two youngsters there. I don't know if Alexis is still here or she left. Uh, Alexis is here? Alexia. Alexis. Alexis told me on front, uh, up front there, she has a dream, is to bring peace on earth. It's a wonderful dream. So, and uh, I briefly spoke to Mia. Mia, stand up for a second. Mia has a dream. She would like to become a nurse. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. So, so the, the Mr. Holder said, speak your dreams out loud and get used to the sound of it. So will the people around you. Even your detractors may be convinced by your determination. Dr. Sprega. I am so impressed with the way you speak your dream out loud. 
You may not know that, but every incoming caller to the college will hear a tape message from Dr. Sprega. The message is loud and clear. Uh, done very honestly, says, hello, you've reached Bristol Community College, where we change the world, learner by learner. That's very impressive, you know? That is very impressive. And, and when I heard before that, the job you're doing with 12,000 college students in the student body, I can only applaud you for your commitment to education. Of course, it's not enough to only to speak your dream out loud. You have to live the dream. You have to nurture the dream. There is often a price to be paid. The price is the series of challenges after challenges you will face like mountains behind mountains described by Nelson Mandela or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But I dare to say these challenges are only to test the integrity, the intensity, the commitment of your dream. As the Reverend King said in 1963, and I have a dream speech, let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, and so often though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. I thank all of you for your attention and may your dreams come true. Thank you, sir. Dr. Clara Antoine, ladies and gentlemen, what a dream, what a wonderful dream. Speak his dream. I don't know about you, I get, I get a little nervous when my seat heater in the car doesn't warm up quickly enough, and uh, that's why I'm complaining. The things that he had to overcome, that's wonderful. Well, we're going to have the New Bedford uh, Bethel AME Choir join us again. And uh, we're going to close with our proceedings. Thank you all for coming. We're going to uh, have our proceedings with the We Shall Overcome tradition that we have here. And uh, I hope that uh, we can keep hope alive and keep the dream alive. Thank you very much. This song is representing the pastor and the doctor. <laughs> is
Jacob. Now we'll do, if you could rise, we'll do uh, We Shall Overcome. And one last uh, reminder about uh, Bethel AME uh, service at 1115 on Hanover Street. I hope you can join us. Thank you very much. We shall at Bethel AME Hanover Street in Fall River um, and also we'll keep that dream alive. Thank you very much.